welcome back to Voices of the West. Today, we continue our conversation with Ken Farmer as we are looking at all about Westerns and all about writing and everything else that can come up along the way. Ken, good morning and welcome back. How you doing, sir? Ah, keeping you. well on things. Well, good to see anybody in the morning. You know, you know how it goes. <laughs> I was you there. Our age. Oh, wait a minute. You're, you're, you're still a baby, so then I... I'll take that that while I can still claim that. <laughs> so today we're looking at a little bit more on your overall process of writing. We've determined you're a heavy pantser on things, characters come first, and variety of issues that go along with that. Wanted to look more at, okay, you've got your character in mind now. Right. What happens next? Uh, I start writing no concept of where it's going at all you just start writing um i start i make a movie up here and i have no idea what they're going to do or say they just start talking i start writing it down you know i i know it sounds rather odd and you know how do you do that i, I have no clue i don't know it's just there you know when uh the story i i, I know that I have a, a cover. I always like to start with a book the title and the cover, which gives me a concept view of where they're going. It like, okay, uh, when I came up with the title Red Canyon, um, and then I, okay, I found, you know, uh, a canyon and I put silhouetted two uh, writers, a man and a woman, uh, from the back, and a silhouette of a canine, which he's actually a half wolf in, in the story, and he's a con continuing character. And I had him riding into this canyon. Okay, so the picture was there, the story starts. But I, you know, you, you have to always go back and say, well, why are they there? Yeah, why drive into the canyon? <laughs> yeah. So um, I created that they were uh, tasked by Deputy U.S. Marshal uh, McGann in Oklahoma because he was down with the lumbago and couldn't go after some bank robbers who were who had robbed a bank in the Oklahoma Territory, which is the western uh, half of Oklahoma back during those days. And um, then, a, oh, and, and he told them who the, the bank robbers were because they identified themselves, you know, during the robbery, so to speak. Um, and actually, I, I started that and I, I went back and I said, you know, I'm going to start with the robbery. I always, I love to start a book with the story, not the backstory. And I start with the, with the train robbery. Mm -hmm. And um, they call each other by name and it's Butch and Sundance. And then when he tells Lorraine, when Bone tells Lorraine, she says, who are we going after? He says, ah, some guy named Butch Cassidy and, Sun and Sundance Kid. He says, you're kidding me. You know, because they're from the future. They seen the movie. <laughs> That's and right. So a lot of it is, is a little tongue in cheek because they're able to play off because they, like I said, saw the movie. And so anyway, it just, it just all of a sudden just started gushing the story and the doubt, you know, had, and then there was a, a outlaw gang who heard that they had robbed the bank and they were going to rob Butch and Sundance because they wanted the payroll. And then of course the U S uh, deputy U S marshals were after them because they stole federal money. So they're just all the elements are there and they get going. So I had figured, that since Butch and Sundance had that famous picture taken in Fort Worth, that they had to get to to uh, Fort Worth from Wyoming 
somehow. Got to go through Oklahoma. What the heck? Pick a so, pocket change while you're at it. Oh, uh, yeah. Why not? He said, well, oh, son of a gun. Look what just falling in their lap. So, you know, who knows if it's accurate or not? And that's why I love to write fiction is that uh, nobody, unless you were there, nobody knows. Indeed. You know, you can't be there all of the time. And, you know, even to the ending of the movie where they got killed in uh, South America and Bolivia, uh, Butch's sister says, oh, they came, they're here. That, that was just the story to throw the Pinkertons off their trail. And Butch died in 1939 in, in uh, Nevada, mm -hmm. according to his sister. According to his sister, indeed. <laughs> Lots of controversy all over on all of that there. Oh, who cares? You know, that's when we can take our literary license. Nobody knows. It could have happened. Can stop. Yeah. That's how we illustrate history to make it even more bright and vibrant. That's true. What was that? What's that line from um, uh, the man who killed Liberty Valance? Uh, oh, when the legend is bigger than the truth, print the legend. <laughs> and that was basically how journalism worked at that period, anyways. What do you mean, still does? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Go with the legend or whatever is being told you to do. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. Whatever sells. Whatever sells the most papers. Absolutely. Right. And so in this case, whatever sells the most books. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's the way they come. I never know from whence they come. They're just there. They just, uh, you know, the muse will, will tap me on the ear and, and say, you know, uh, what about Butch and Sundance? Well, I did that already, okay? And so, you know, and, and, and it's humorous. I used the same personality that uh, uh, they did in the movie, the personalities that uh, Redford and uh, uh, Paul, you know, had with each other, that interplay and humor and just the whole. And then when, uh, of course, Bone and Lorraine are always, um, they're almost like the honeymooners, you know, they, they're constantly picking at one another, but uh, he has a line that I wrote in this latest book that says, um, I may say stupid things sometimes, my push off. I laugh when I'm not supposed to. I'm a little crazy and probably won't change. Love me or not, but I guarantee that if I love you, it's with a full heart. The rain looks at the others. Now, see, he pesters me all the time. Then he says something like that. Alice turned to her. What's a kushla mean? Lorraine smiled and looked at Bone. It's Gaelic meaning pulse of my heart. Alice looked like she was going to cry. Oh, that's so sweet. I see what you mean. And so, you know, that is, that's the kind of thing, you know, that the topics that he makes that he constantly, and she'll say, damn you, Bone. And she can throw him across the room. You know, he's 6'8", 285 pounds, but she is a third degree black belt Kung Fu. And that's when he, he said, you know, demonstrate some of that stuff to me. And she, over her head, landed eight feet away. All the air goes out of his lungs. You know, whoosh. You know, and uh, he looks up. Uh, okay, I got it. So what would you tell people in your classes? How would you guide them on coming up with plot lines? Don't think about it. I have a, an expression that so every step you take, towards analyzing the story or the plot or the character takes you one step away from the story, plot, or the characters. Follow your instincts. And I, I you know, I'm very well aware of, you know, first act, second act, third act, story arc, character arcs, 
plot arcs, you know, all of that crap. I teach it, okay? But I say, if you have to think about that stuff, you're already in trouble. Because you just taken all the life out of your story. But when I finish a book, I don't know how, but it's all there. First act, second act, third act, you know, uh, climax, uh, uh, arc, all of it. And it's just, I don't know why. I mean, it's just, but I don't think about it. It just, that, that's the way the story comes out in my head. Now, everybody can't do that. I know some people just have to outline. Mm -hmm. okay, they got to have a roadmap. Fine. It's really whatever works for you. And that works for me. I can just call it creativity. Mm -hmm. Which That's something I can't teach. Nobody can. It's like being, you know, uh, uh, Usain Bolt and get, run a nine flat hundred. Not everybody can do that. Very few, in fact, only Usain. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody can be M. Smith or Barry Sanders. That's just, you know, it's a, it's a thing you're given and you, the idea is to make the best use of what you have and find your niche and develop it. Mm -hmm. now, you know, nobody writes, starts writing as a perfect writer. You know, we, we, we learn by writing and it gets smoother. And I think the first novel that I wrote was like 125,000 words. Well, that's too damn many for a good action book. So, you know, I have learned over a period of time to lean them down, mm -hmm. get them down so that they, you know, move along, move the story. And it's, when I finish sometimes a book, and I just finished one yesterday and sent it off to uh, uh, Nick at, at Dusty Saddles. Um, and I rested all afternoon. I was exhausted. When I finished, you know, did the book, finished book, you know, and, and had to wait, eh, 24 hours or so, because I send each chapter as I finish it to my six beta readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one, I think I had dropped an uh, opening quote, which I do sometimes, just write a lot, because I don't rewrite. And I, I will proof a couple of times, then I send it to them. Sometimes, knock on wood, sometimes it comes back, no suggestions, no changes, no errors. I said, oh, okay, yeah. And then the next it's time. You've been right this time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there'll be, you know, six or seven. Uh, well, you got a comma splice here. And, and this is usually, like I said, one of my, uh, uh, beta readers is a uh, professor of English literature, uh, college level, and she will eat my lunch. But she's also has become a very good writer in her own, which I coached her along to write. And and once I got her out of that writing like an English teacher and being you know overly wordy, you know she's become an excellent writer. Uh, with Civil War tomes, and um, then, but she, you know, she won't let me get away with nothing. Even the the hated Oxford comma, uh, rather take a whipping with a wet rope. Yeah, commas definitely. Well, they pop up everywhere, and you don't need them anywhere. So yeah, it, it's <laughs> what, what some places you do. I can understand Indeed. that repetitive things. But when you get to that last one and then you have a conjunction, what do you need a comma there for? You got a conjunction. 
I always heard that was optional. And, <laughs> and a comma was originally created so that they could breathe. Mm -hmm. It's a slight breathe in. pause, very slight pause, longer than a period and shorter than an ellipsis. Now, I'm a big user of ellipses. I love ellipses, especially, uh, you know, in, in dialogue. Now, I do not use ellipses at all in narrative. I will use an M batch, but not an ellipse. Except, I always end up except everything. Else. At the end of a chapter, if it's a cliffhanger, there's an ellipse after the last word, meaning, continuing action but i'm not going to tell you at the start of the next chapter it'll be somewhere in the chapter later so so you have to read to see what happened you know uh cold train uh uh flip backwards out of the saddle as the sound of the rifle from the distance slammed into a uh, bullet slammed into it ellipses we don't, it, 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 it's dead. Yeah, we got to see what happens next. No, we don't know. We're, we're going to go to the next chapter, and it's like a movie. It goes somewhere else. <laughs> Makes you wait and work your way through. I'll wait until I get around to telling what happened to him. But with a comma, if there's not a pause, because now I read every word as I write it, especially dialogue. And if there's not any hesitation in there, I don't put a comma. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, there's no pause, there's no hesitation. You've got commas, periods, and ellipses. The only three hesitations in writing a novel. And then, except, it, you know, you don't necessarily, I read it out loud, but if I put a M dash, I mean, just I'm I'm changing the subject, but I don't want another sentence here. I'm not going to write a full subject predicate no less, but it's just an idea. So it's a, so you put a M dash, which is longer than an ellipsis. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> Well, you've got an awful lot of knowledge of proper styles for being able to write something for somebody that doesn't really claim to have one when they actually do it. <laughs> I know how it works. I just, you know, I've researched it, I've studied it, but I don't use, I, I say, okay, I know it, how it works. For example, I, I would teach this in my acting classes. I used to keep a tennis ball hanging, you know, uh, on, on the on the lectern and sometimes I would just flip it at somebody and they I said did you have to think about that well no I just caught it I said bingo if you have to think about it you're in trouble oh there is a ball coming at my face I will hold up my hand and ow if you have to think about it, it's too late. <laughs> Very Writing true. is the same. If you have to think about it, you have lost it to me. So I just, I write so instinctively. It's just what, that's why I don't rewrite. I've gone back and reread books that I wrote 10 years ago. Didn't change a thing would not change a thing. I, said, I can't see how to rewrite, you know? Everybody says, oh, I have to, you've got to rewrite. No, you know, not if it comes out the way you want it to begin with. So and that I bring up the question of, are you writing for yourself with whatever streams from your consciousness, or do you have a reader in mind ever when you're writing? Me, I write it for me. I write what I like and I write it for me. And um, that's why I would never get an editor. You try to change it, I'll hurt you. <laughs> you know, I will not, especially you know my dialogue. Now I consider that sacrosanct. 
you know, I got 45 years as an actor. Okay, I kind of know how. And one of the things an actor does, he listens to how people talk. So I write my character's dialogue. I write how people talk, whether it's in 1898 or 2023. And depends on, is it an English professor? Is it a construction worker? Is it a cowboy? What? Mm -hmm. You write the way they talk. So that requires some degree of research and listening to how people converse. And most people don't know how to write dialogue, meaning that means two, two people conversing with each other. I'm not talking about soliloquy. No, this is not Hamlet. I'm not going to give you three pages of a soliloquy. Hopefully nobody really has that much to talk to themselves about to start with. Yeah, I don't, yeah where the heck does that come from? Anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, I love, I learned something one time from one of Tell Cotton's books. Um, guy wrote and says, uh, and stopped off at, at the sheriff's office and, and asked him, says, yeah, I'm hungry. You want to go over to, to Mays and get something to eat? Pete? Do. That was the answer. Do. Are, yeah. are you hungry? I am. Don't say any more than you have to. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, a writer might write, I'm really hungry. Why not? Why? Just say, are you hungry? Am. Have you ever regretted something that you've written into a plot? A lot of times be like, have you killed off a character that people absolutely loved and said, why did you do this? No, I, if I kill them off and the thing that I hate to do, but I have to, but I, so I do it is kill off an occasional pet, dog or horse. I wrote a scene in Haunted Falls where guys, his companion named Boots, bad guys shot him during a uh, confrontation and he carried it out and I can't really tell it because I'll stop crying right here. But I cried for three days. Every time I tried to go back and proof it or whatever, I couldn't even see the screen. And I said, oh, Lord, if, if it does that to me. And I have read that 10 times. And cry every time. I said, what's it going to do to the reader? I, I posted another one um, from um, one of my books. Um, uh, it was called The Pond, one of my Southern Noir mysteries of this, this, this uh, nine-year-old boy uh, thinks his, his pet, his dog has been killed, uh, kicked by uh, the, one of the bad guys and, uh, it, you know, bleeding from the nose and eyes and limp and not moving and, and he carries it home and and his grandmother says, I'll wrap it up. And, and you know, wrote that three years ago, glanced over it yesterday, actually posted it on Facebook as a lecture, and tears are rolling down my face. And I wrote the damn thing. But every time I read it, I cry. When I write, I become the character. And I think that is vital for a novel. You have to become the character if you're going to write how they think. Whether you're, you know, you're, you're playing the bad guy or the good guy or woman. Doesn't matter. I become that character. And, and I just thank the, the stars of about 45 years as 
a trained, I have a degree in theater, thank you very much, as a trained actor. It is all about character. Characters tell the story. Get out of their way and let them tell the damn story. And most writers can't get out of their own way and they interfere with their own story. And the worse, the more they interfere with it, the worse it gets. That's just my thought. Have you ever had a character that you enjoyed so much, but the way that you wrote on the on the book didn't allow you to bring them back? Oh yeah. Except if if I kill them, then I can't bring them back. But uh, you know, it's it's not uh, Bobby in in Dallas episode. You know, uh, where everything was a dream. But I, you know, I can't. But yeah, I said nah. But when I decide to kill them, then there is, it's, you know, that Stephen King thing, kill your darlings. Mm -hmm. You have to kill your darlings. Because what, what do we write for? Emotion. Make the reader happy, make him sad. Make him happy, make him sad. That's why they read. Indeed. That's why they read fiction. I mean, they want to be entertained and you entertain with the emotion. I wrote a dictionary of 900 emotions in my acting book that I wrote in, in uh, 96. 900 emotions defined wow. for the actor to not that you use them, but you are aware of all of these emotion and because emotions are in nuance. Mm -hmm. You got hate, love, you got all the base, the, the master emotions, but each one, there's so many nuances in love, so many nuances in hate that, and it comes out to about 900. So of 900, what's your favorite to write about? All of them. There is no, it's like a child. There is no favorite. You have to have all of the emotions. That's why I can't watch, you know, the, some of the more popular TV shows because I call them, you know, one, uh, one note Charlie. It's all dark or whatever it might be. But you cannot have uh, good drama without humor. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, that's just the way I think about it. So everything I write, there's an occasional humorous moment, which is created by the character. Everybody laughs. I, I posted a thing today on Facebook, uh, if you focus on bringing sunshine and laughter to others, you cannot keep it from yourself. Indeed. So I just don't like a book to finish on a, what I call a downer. I want you to feel good when you finish. Now, I will finish a chapter on a downer but it'll be a cliffhanger down and then the opening of the next chapter i'm going to bring you up. i'll take you take you off the floor and hang you in the ceiling up here somewhere <laughs> and i don't know i don't think about it but that's just the way it comes out mm -hmm. if somebody can can figure out how i do it, i would love to know you just got the own meter and timing all going on in your brain all the time with that. It's bare. You know, it's just, but it, I think a lot of it has, has come from practice. Mm -hmm. Write and write. You learn to write by writing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've said that three times. Didn't I? You learn to write by writing, right? Oh. Okay. <laughs> because it just seems to get better. 
And yeah. I, what I have learned over the years and 50 novels is that I want each one to be smooth as silk. That puts the reader in the story because they can actually imagine it like a movie like I did. When they're there, they're, they enjoy being said, I feel like I'm in some review. I feel like I'm in there with them. That's the idea. That's why I don't use tags or anything that, that makes it look like, you know, uh, I am manipulating the story with he said, he demanded, you know, he angrily replied, if I'm writing it well, I don't need to tell the reader he's angry. It'll be obvious he's angry. I don't need to say he angrily replied. It just drives me crazy. It's like fingernails down a blackboard <laughs> to me. And so many writers do that. I just, I can't. It throws me, it's like, like derailing the train. Yeah, very much. No. And if you end it all on a positive note, then people want to buy the next one. And, and know when to shut up. Yeah like a speaker you know that that talks too much and doesn't know when to shut up when you're writing know when to shut up and go to the next great words of wisdom from my friend's dad was never never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut bingo that's almost as good as never pass up a good op opportunity to just sit a while and ponder. Absolutely. Well, Ken, thank you very much again. Are we done again? Yeah, we are done again. Time just goes. And we've got to drag our feet a little bit sometimes. <laughs> but since this all started, I have now signed with Dusty Saddle. Indeed. And uh, sent Nick my first book and um, wants me to do a, um, uh, a joint write with uh, Casey Nash. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Casey's a nice guy. I like talking to him. Yeah. Yeah, we, we visited on this Zoom thing uh, the other day. And uh, working, I said, okay, I said, you got to let me finish, you know, the two I'm working on now. I'm going to get them out. But I got one to bed, put it to bed, send it off yesterday. And uh, then today I started uh, back on um, Toby Man, the, the classic Western third book in the Cold Train series, which I already had seven, eight chapters written. And so I'll, I'll finish it out here in the next month. And then we'll get started on the joint. Yeah, on to what comes next. Absolutely. Oh, he said, you got any ideas for story? I said, not a one. <laughs> No, have any clue it'll just it'll come you know it, it's like you you asked me before are there any uh plots or or uh stories that, that i want to write or i haven't seen written no nope. you know i've, I've written if i if i thought about them i wrote them. Mm -hmm. i just never know when they're going whenever she says you know here's an idea I, I see things happen, and I think, oh, I'm a good story. Bing. Uh, all right, man. <laughs> I'm just always, talking, absolutely. I'm just always open to ideas for my story. So I'm just, you know, not careful. I'm just careful about not di dismissing something. That, ooh, I'm not a good story. Uh, when I was research and found uh, uh, F.M. Miller uh, in the newspaper in 1891 as the only female deputy marshal, uh, only female deputy marshal to work the Indian nations under Judge Park. Nobody had ever written about it. I said, well, duh. Bingo. A whole series on her. Wrote seven books. 
absolutely a brilliant little bit of inspiration with that and it was so funny casey has used the character fiona miller deputy u.s deputy marshal fiona miller in one of his books and i asked him i said where'd you get the name fiona because she's listed in the paper as fm miller nowhere does it say what her first name was i created that and put it in my book uh bass and the lady and one of his uh fans asked him why he didn't write about fiona miller <laughs> i said i named her so this it's, should already, be interesting. it's already making the circle yeah but, coming right back to you what you created that's a beautiful yeah. thing yeah i said holy cow because i had never seen you know i i, I looked a lot no could not find what fm stood for so i created fiona may and that's her name in seven books and actually she's in this one that i'm writing now toby Bell. and now it's being recommended to others <laughs> that's some good influence can you know, argue with that little, he's got it in one of his books absolutely so, okay I said, you can put me in, in the credits in the back. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing what the two of you put together. Yeah, me too. I got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he wants to use um, uh, his uh, character that he's got. Let's see, what's his uh, Marshall, uh, oh, his main guy. Uh, I'll be blank. Stone, yeah. St uh, is it Stone? Jubal. 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 And uh, I said, okay, I'll probably use uh, Bone and Lorraine. I said, my two time traveler cops from 2014 who are trapped in the uh, 19, uh, late 1800s. <laughs> and, you know, so I've got, like, golly, they've been in like 14 books so far. They don't want to go back. Yeah. They like it. They got a life that's doing well for them. Yeah. Yeah. He's well, a, thank I, you again, Ken. Appreciate yes. all the time on all of this as always. And hopefully we'll be talking again very soon. Enjoy the singing and the recording. As always.